The last time I came here, I was okay, in we're live. I was in the All right, okay, we'll start again. Hey, I think we are ready. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on uh, Africa 54 live on Facebook. Here in the studios of The Voice of America, I'm joined by Kenya's Deputy President, William Ruto. Honorable William Ruto. Thank you so much for making it to the Voice of America. Thank We're you very so much. happy to have you live on Facebook. Let's deal with the issues of the day. You are running for the top seat in Kenya on August 9th, right? That's what is, correct. What's your vision for Kenya? Why do you want to become the next president of Kenya? Um, it's my belief that uh, Kenya is at, uh, at a point in the journey of a nation that requires decisive, firm, focused, and visionary leadership. And I believe that uh, I have the qualities to take Kenya to the next level. I um, and my team, we have developed a plan and we have a track record. I have been deputy president for nine years. I have clarity in where this country is. I have uh, clarity on where it should go from here. There are things we have done over the last nine years that have given me the persuasion that indeed we can make Kenya a different country in a very short while. Let's digest that for I a little am, bit, I am Deputy very President. Confident because that Kenya can can go to the next level. You have a vision and you have been deputy president for the last nine years. Correct. What are the things that didn't go well that you feel once you become the president of Kenya, you will make right? Precisely. When we came into office in twenty thirteen, we set about going to build a foundation. And that foundation we um, appropriated that we needed to build a solid foundation of infrastructure, uh, of training, of uh, energy distribution. On, 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 on the foundation of uh, infrastructure, we built 700 kilometers of rail. We built 10,000 kilometers of tarmac. We've generated and distributed electricity to eight and a half million people. And we have built, apart from uh, secondary education, we've built training for skills and competences with 170 technical training colleges. It is on that foundation that I believe the takeoff for Kenya uh, is now ready. And among us, the things as you've asked correctly, the things that we didn't manage to achieve in the last eight years, and especially in the last five years. We had set out a program called the Big Four that had huge investments that would create jobs, that had investments in agriculture that would not only build uh, capacity, it would also enhance productivity of our uh, very progressive farming uh, um, endeavors. And we had in it a whole uh, program on universal health coverage and manufacturing. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the Big Four plan did not go as we had planned. Why? Because we got ourselves engaged in another program that was not part of the agenda upon which we were elected. And the program was what you know or what is now called as the handshake and the BBI and everything else before, that went in that direction. I, I get it. But before we get to the BBI, the yeah. Building Bridges Initiative uh, that uh, President Kenyatta started, and then, of course, the handshake with uh, his former rival, uh, Honorable Raila Odinga, what happened between the two of you? And I'll ask you this because mm -hmm. 
-hmm. when, when the two of you were, yeah. I'm going to say the Kenyan way, were roasting at the ICC. Uh -huh. You both got exonerated, you went back to Kenya. Yes. You became like brothers. You actually used to dress the same way, same suit, same ties. I mean, Kenyans were mesmerized. The mm -hmm. world was. The people who knew, oh, mm -hmm. these guys came back, they are like brothers, they are fighting, they won't become president and deputy president. You worked it out. And you see, for Kenyans, they yearn for cohesion, they yearn mm -hmm. for harmony. And they hadn't seen that in a long time. Mm. This is a country of uh, more than 40 ethnic uh, languages and communities. Mm. So they saw something good in that and they voted you in. The first term went well. The second term, where did the fallout between you, Deputy President Ruto and President Uhuru Kenyatta come <laughs> from? What happened? Tell us. <laughs> um, history is going to be written one day. And I'm sure details will be out there. But let me say the following. In our first term, we were focused as a, as a government on delivery of our plan. And that is why our first term stands out. Every um, legacy program President Uhuru Kenyatta will go home with is the programs of the first term. Whether you talk about the SGR, whether you talk about our road network, whether we talk about our electricity connection, whether we talk about the equipment we have supplied in our referral hospitals, whether we talk about uh, the TVET program, that's all first term. Fine, but what happened? Second term, because we got I a lot told, of stuff. We need you, to get second to, term. Yes. We got ourselves engaged mm -hmm. in this handshake that was built to be uh, an exercise to bring people together. And, and, and as President Kenyatta has said, I was briefed. We, 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 he, he, President Kenyatta informed me. In fact, before Raila Odinga engaged President Kenyatta, he tried to engage me. And it's in the public domain. But is there, is there anything President, wrong to yeah. build bridges? Absolutely. There is no w Wasn't no that problem. a good thing, like reach out no to problem. the opposition, build Kenya? There was no problem. Mm -hmm. But the things we had agreed upon as part, forming part of the handshake, it mutated into something else. Mm -hmm. We didn't discuss, for example, that it would be an exercise to kill the opposition and to kill oversight. We didn't discuss, for example, that members of the ruling party would be jettisoned so that members of the opposition can occupy committees in parliament. We didn't agree, for example, that this was an exercise in changing the constitution. And we didn't agree that this was an exercise in succession. So the thorny so issues the that whole, you did not agree with... So everything we didn't agree with became uh, the handshake, except for the things we had agreed upon. In fact, uh, um, I had been informed that Raila Odinga had agreed that um, he wanted to be uh, facilitated to retire. And I remember asking, really, do you expect? We know, we know Raila Odinga and we know his games. And, and I was saying that time, I don't think Raila Odinga but, is but going I'll to say, retire. I'll say this to I you, think Deputy he's going President. to talk about the constitution. And every fear that I had has come to be. I, I'll say this to you, uh, Deputy President yes. Ruto. Before Uhuru Kenyatta, mm -hmm. you and Raila Odinga mm. were working together. Mm -hmm. You were in the opposition with him mm -hmm. until, of course, this uh, elephant of ICC came and then, mm. you know, you found yourselves together. Mm. Of course, you came back, like we said, you mm. became good friends, you worked for the government. Things were moving and people were happy, but things didn't go well. So the two of them have been your friends, but now Correct. you're not. <laughs> and it is so clear and, and by the language, it, it doesn't look that way. And, and for yes. your information, mm -hmm. Esther, we started ODM, all of us together, <laughs> President Kenyatta, myself, Raila Odinga, mm -hmm. and many others. Okay. Right? So as to being on the same side, yes, we've been on the same side. But um, when you work with people, then you discover there are people you can work with, and there are people you can't work with. And I have absolutely no problem with the handshake. The only problem I have with it is it became what we didn't agree it to be. And in the process, the people of Kenya lost. Okay. We lost the opposition. We lost the ruling party. 
We lost our government. We lost the big four plan. We lost direction. And because you lost direction, Kenyans lost direction. Let me tell you the bigger biting issues because look, mm. I come from there. We mm -hmm. have families there. We, you know how it is here in America. Mm. You're going to meet the diaspora, they probably will confront you with the same kinds of questions. The moral fabric of Kenya has gone way so bad mm. that what we're reading every day is killings, children being killed, people have lost their mind, there is no food on the table, the economy has dwindled, and there is high level corruption. This is the root cause of the problem in Kenya. Every day we wake up, we're looking at the newspapers, we're reading stories that we've never seen before in the history of Kenya, where a woman will wake up and poison her kids because she can't handle it anymore. Deputy President, you are on the front lines in the churches. We know where you stand with your faith. What is wrong with the Kenyan fabric? Why are Kenyans so desperate to that level? We read this news and we wonder what's going on with our motherland. It is not good at all. What are you going to do about it? Because you're running for the top seat on what grounds now if people cannot put, put food on the table? People are committing suicide. There's even incest in the families. We gotta tell it like it is because that's what's happening in Kenya. How are you going to address that? Because all we see is that little bickering of politicians while people are suffering. Yes, there's COVID, that is global. What is the problem with Kenya? What's the problem with this high level corruption? What's the problem with not putting food on the table? Why can't we feed Kenyans? Why can't you feed Kenyans? You're the leaders. It's your responsibility. Answer me because I'm very emotional on that topic. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you very much, Esther, and I feel you. Yes. Um, to be able to diagnose the problem of Kenya in this interview, we will not do justice to it. Well, highlight a few things. So I, I'm going to give you the broad picture. Things are difficult in Kenya, but they are not as bad as you've described. I, I think, mm -hmm. I think, uh, we'll, we'll see the feedback I think on been, Facebook. I've been, I think you've been reading the social media too much. No, no, no. <laughs> no. But yes. we have a situation that needs to be addressed. Yes. And that situation is not out of control. I can tell you that, um, yes, we can deal with the problem of hunger in our country. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, we dropped uh, the subsidies on agriculture inputs and by so doing lowered the productivity of our farmers. It is my very strong belief that the very first thing that we must do is to sort out our agriculture. How do we do it? One, we need to put in resources to make sure that we enhance the productivity of our farmers. That productivity of our farmers, whether you're talking about milk, whether you're talking about tea, whether you're talking about coffee, whether you're talking about uh, sugarcane, maize, wheat, rice, enhancing productivity is the way to go. And we have all the planks in place to enhance the productivity of our farmers. Because it is through enhancing the productivity of our, of our farmers that we can um, produce food in enough quantities, be able to lower the price of those quantities, and be able to make sure that every Kenyan can afford a meal. Um, as a result of the economic challenges, uh, you've said correctly, brought about by COVID, but again, brought about by an economic model that uh, doesn't carry everybody, you know, because of trickle-down economics. Fewer people are included in the economic cycle, and the majority are left out. So and that is why yeah. we are proposing uh, the, the team that uh, myself, uh, Musalia Mudabadi, uh, Moses Wetangula, and many other Kenyans lead are proposing a bottom-up economic model yes, that and, puts uh, money in people's pockets. And that takes me and, to... And, and it is uh, an innovation and it is a realization that even in this country, uh, they, they, they believe that the trickle-down economic model hasn't worked.
Okay. I, so, so, I uh, heard Joe Biden um, two days ago say exactly that. I hear that, uh, Deputy President. So that brings me to your Monica, the Hustler Nation. How is viable is that? And for people who probably don't know what the Hustler Nation is, it's like mm -hmm. you wanted to say you started way poor. You are out there, you know, hustling for, to, to, to make ends meet. But uh, a lot of people don't buy that either. They feel that you've been in a political you know, path for a long time with uh, former President Daniel Arap Moy. So y you've been able to make some money. You've been able to do okay. And a lot of people who are hustlers, they are people who can hardly put food on the table or have two meals a day. And so how do you, uh, what's your vision of this hustler nation? How are you going to build that up for people who can't even afford a meal a day? The hustler nation is about an economy. And it's about an economy that works for everybody. Um, the hustler nation is not about rich people versus poor people. That's not what it is. The Hustler Nation is about a nation of possibilities, a nation that uh, gives equal chance to every citizen and provides a ladder for every citizen to climb the, up the economic ladder. And if you listen carefully about our proposals on the bottom-up economic model, it's about the people who have no jobs. How do we create jobs deliberately? How do we put resources where we can deliberately create more jobs so that we can get people off the streets give into some, work? Give me some samples of How? that because it's your vision. How do you do For that? example, yes. in our Big Four plan, we had a whole um, program on social, low income, low cost housing. It wasn't about the houses. It was about the jobs. And for your information, we got close to 4 trillion Kenya shillings of commitments of people who are ready to partner with the government of Kenya in that program. However, and unfortunately, that program hasn't taken off because we have been busy doing the BBI and the rest of it. So th these are deliberate programs. The second item is to make sure that the, 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 the 10 million old people who are in the micro, small and medium enterprise space who today have no access to credit, they pay as much as 1,000, maybe 2,000, sometimes 3,000 percent a year, while corporates pay 10 percent a year. So, it's about access to credit for small business. It's about access to inputs for farmers. It's about access uh, to opportunities for young people. That is what this is all about. That is what bottom up is all about. How do you get the people at the bottom of the pyramid who have jobless to jobs? Let, let, How do you get people on. at the bottom of the pyramid who have no access I, to credit to point. access credit? Let's get How on. do you get our they may peasant not get farmers on because to access uh, for a long time, uh, Deputy resources President, and, and, and inputs? Corruption That's has how. been endemic in Kenya, and you know that. We've seen uh, you know, millions of shillings taken, and I was going to take one of your ally now, Governor Waiguru, but she didn't you know, uh, make it for this uh, uh, interview because when she was the Devol devolution cabinet secretary 700 you know 85 95 million shillings disappeared and, and part of it was a big scandal a uh, part of that was used to buy condoms i mean and then even though she left that position and vied for you know a county governorship that money has not been filed. We never had anything about that money being, being filed. And I'm not only pinning that. What I'm talking about is there has been high-level corruption in Kenya. How do you counter that to make sure this kind of money you are looking for, to bring back the economy, to put money and food on the table of Kenyans, can be found? How are people going to be held accountable for this? And where do, we, do you get back that money from? Esther, you have said it. Corruption it's away the soul of our nation and our proposal on dealing with corruption is not to point fingers it's not to personalize mm -hmm. 
it is not me versus you. It is ensuring that we institutionalize the fight against corruption. Corruption should not be a tool for political contest. Corruption should be a, a, a fight to protect the resources of the Kenyan people. And our proposal is threefold. Number one, there is absolutely no reason why the judiciary fund has not been operationalized. There is absolutely no reason why court cases take anywhere to 15 years, whether it's corruption cases, whether it is disputes. The first item that we are proposing as Kenya Kwanzaa is to make sure that we operationalize the judiciary fund that is in the Constitution. There is absolutely no so reason. So if you get this the top not, seat, if you get the top is, seat you're looking for. We are talking about for. fighting corruption, right? Yes. How do you plan to act swiftly? What mm. do you need to do to act swiftly to make sure that even the cases the that have been pending, the, the money that the disappeared, the, can come back? The judiciary fund is something that can be operationalized within the first 100 days. The, that will give financial independence to our judiciary so that our judiciary can discharge their mandate in accordance with the constitution make sure that the people who pilferage corruptly public resources are not only held to account but speedily so the second item is to ensure that investigations and uh, uh, working on cases is worked on by the independent institution and that institution must have financial independence. Today, the IG, the DCI, and all the investigative uh, agencies in the criminal justice system uh, have to wait for resources from the Office of the President because they yes. do not have De De an independent... Right. Deputy uh, President, I, I, I know we, because of... Uh, uh, an independent accounting officer. Yes. So, an independent budget to an independent institution, it's already in the constitution, yes. it is not uh, any invention you are going to make. That way we can hold everybody to account. So, so and lastly, yes. we must have an accountable executive so by making sure the oversight responsibility of the legislature is not compromised in any way. So Today, uh, yeah. that we're, is we're, we're almost wrapping up. So I want compromised. You, yes, I want you to get seriously. Into, yes, because I, I of the you. confusion mm -hmm. there is between who is in government, who is in the opposition. Nobody is nowhere. While you're here in the U.S., and I hope you can make this as brief as you can, you there were claims that you've made of uh, possible rigging of the upcoming elections and uh, your idea of whether IEBC is independent or it's not. Give us a thought on that. Should we trust the results of the upcoming elections? What is your take? Because there was stuff written about what you said. You are kind of concerned that there could be possible rigging of the up upcoming presidential election. Let me make it brief because our time is running out. We have confidence in the ability of the Independent Boundaries, uh, Electoral and Boundaries Commission to run a credible election. We have absolutely no doubt in our minds that without interference, the IEBC have the capacity to deliver on their mandate. All right. That's number one. But when you have public...